And welcome back. Our first conversation this morning, as you would notice, we have been joined by Dr. Cecilio Eck, and he is here in his capacity as a pediatrician to talk to us about several topics, including the seasonal flu that we're sort of seeing cases already, mm -hmm. and certainly uh, a little bit about the meningitis situation that we've been seeing uh, in Belmopan recently. Good morning, Dr. Eck. Morning, Isan. Morning, April. Morning. Thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Let's talk about the seasonal <coughs> flu and what can be done perhaps to mitigate against it when it comes to kids. We're looking at children who are susceptible to catching a flu and the effects of it may be adverse in some cases. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about that. Well, the way I speak about health and preventative uh, medicine with kids is mm -hmm. start at a very foundation level where yeah. you let them go to sleep mm -hmm. and get a good night's rest. So I tell people, get rid of all the, all the devices out the room so it doesn't um, ding and wake them up mm -hmm. to sleep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A proper diet, you know a lot of our kids are a little on the obese side. So um, my advice with a proper diet is get all the, the, the snacks from the veg shop. Nothing processed, nothing in a bag for them to snack on. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then include exercise in their routine. Those simple three things would actually help boost your immune system without any drugs or multivitamins to help. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that is the foundation. Second part would then be, uh, we could talk about COVID. COVID taught all of us some basic things, how to prevent spread of simple respiratory illnesses but it's the number one cause of illnesses in kids mm -hmm. especially during the winter season during the winter season we get the rhinoviruses mm -hmm. flu virus coronavirus is still around the um <coughs> rotavirus causing the vomiting and loose stool the stomach mm -hmm. flu mm -hmm. and coronavirus start everybody sneeze in the arm wash yeah. hands mm -hmm. if you're sick stay at home if, you, if it's an allergy and they cough, they could still wear a mask when they go mm -hmm. to school. Um, a lot of my little daughter still walks around with her um, sanitizer. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and, and they, you know. Um, but the simple basic things still apply. The, the teachers at school and the parents have a big responsibility with identifying with the parents if their kids mm -hmm. are sick. And with the teachers, if any of the kids are ill, to inform the parents to come and get them. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is some rule with the Ministry of Health that you can't miss a certain number of classes. Yeah. And I, I'm hoping that post-COVID that would change because now post-COVID a lot of, a lot of um, parents are jumpy. Mm -hmm. um, but I tell the administrators, I tell the teachers, I tell the parents, if their kid is sick, don't send them. It doesn't make sense. They'll just spread the love mm -hmm. and it doesn't, um, it doesn't make any sense. Mm. So that's there at the also local level, the, the specific mm -hmm. target, now to answer your question specifically, mm -hmm. is um, there are vaccines. There are vaccines against flu. Yeah. It comes out, we get it in Belize in October, and the, the um, health centers have it, as well as the private institutions. Mm -hmm. And you could take your kids, get the flu vaccine. I have families who book, and they come for their flu flu appointment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From the grannies to the aunties <laughs> to... Everybody, everybody walks in and yeah. then get the shot. How everybody gets a lollipop and go home. How often should we get our flu shot? It should be every year. It comes mm -hmm. out every year. There's mm -hmm. a committee that decides which of the flu serotypes are, or they predict would be most common. Mm -hmm. And that's the vaccine that they create for the following year. Hmm. Sometimes they miss, but most times it's about 50, 60% coverage. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, the, okay, good bit. walk me through this, perhaps from a... a medical or scientific point of view. So there are different strains of the influenza virus, mm -hmm. yes. right? You're talking about a vaccine that is perhaps effective for a year. If you're looking at the fact that perhaps another strain will be predicted next year and than the one that I'm vaccinated for this year. Yep. <clears throat> is there any possibility or likelihood of having a vaccine that covers the gamut? It's a good, excellent question. In the past, no. Mm -hmm. And I would tell um, everyone who asks, for example, with you, you put on mm -hmm. that nice outfit this morning. The flu virus changes the outfit like you for tomorrow, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for next year. 
-hmm. And if you would go, if the next year comes along, that won't work or mm -hmm. vaccines won't work. With COVID again mm -hmm. and the onset of these new vaccine development protocols mm -hmm. or platforms that they developed. Yeah. Um, there is right now in development one that not only targets your outfit on the outside, mm -hmm. the, the spike proteins, the ones mm -hmm. on the outside, but the inner part. Mm -hmm. And if that actually does work, goes through uh, development um, and is effective, that would be the, the golden bullet. Yes. Mm -hmm. I ask that because it brings to mind, well, at least from my point of view here, the strength or effectiveness of my COVID vaccine yeah. Yeah. because COVID-2 <coughs> has multiple strains as we've seen over time. You know, so you have your we went through the yeah. entire Greek alphabet yep. with strains of COVID-19. So, yeah. so I'm thinking, okay, well, the vaccine that was administered to me is across the board, you know, in terms of dealing with the various strains and what have you. And so my rationale for asking the question is, well, shouldn't the same thing apply for uh, influenza? With each, with each uh, bug, it differs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for the big bad bugs like the bacteria, the yeah. ones we get vaccinations mm -hmm. for, um, they have developed vaccines against those that are effective and have been used for years and are known to be safe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With the newer ones, you have to go through a lot of um, trials mm -hmm. to make sure one, they're safe and two, that they're effective. Yeah. We've been seeing a lot of um, flu cases uh, already. It is the season, um, but also stomach viruses as well. Uh, I know we talk about the different preventative measures and so forth, but uh, at the end of the day, I can't just call in sick for a whole week, you know? So what, what can be done? Um, the, maybe the answer to that is yes, you can call in sick for a week. Mm -hmm. And I'll sign your paper. Loader, so that my boss go here. I'll stamp your form, April, <laughs> any day. <laughs> if you're really ill, mm -hmm. you need to mm -hmm. stay at home. I mean, and, and that's how these things spread. So, what are some signs and symptoms should I look out for if I'm already starting to feel? With the stomach flu, it's usually um, hand to mouth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, let's say a mom is taking care of their kid. Their kid starts to vomit, has some loose stool. She cleans them up. She washes her hands, and she doesn't, you know, wash it effectively enough. And then she comes in my office and says, Dr. Eck, I brought some Pringles for you. Mm -hmm. And I eat the Pringles. That's mm -hmm. me. Yeah. Incubation period will go for maybe two days, three days. Mm -hmm. And the symptoms you're speaking about would be belly pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Start to feel rumbly. Bones start to hurt a little bit. Constitutional symptoms like headache, nausea, fever. Mm -hmm. And then when it reaches the critical point, you start to vomit. Mm -hmm. So to have loose tools, you end up upturned and in bed. Mm -hmm. um, for this year, I could tell you we've, we've lost a four-month-old kid to vomiting wow. and loose tools. And um, it's, it's the younger ones usually take the brunt of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The older ones, like me and you, will have a little mm -hmm. belly pain. Mm -hmm. I say, ah, the tacos wasn't good or the coleslaw yeah. was stale or something. Yeah, you mm -hmm. just brush it off or something. Yeah, you you wash your hand and you go about mm -hmm. your business. Mm -hmm. But the younger ones are the ones who end up at the KHMH at my hospital, getting IVs, getting fluids and electrolytes. Um, because their being the immune system, system wouldn't have been fully up. developed yeah. to be able to ward off these kinds of attacks. And they, and they mm -hmm. can't, when they lose a lot of fluid very mm -hmm. quickly, mm -hmm. they can't bounce back like me and you. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's, yeah. the, that's the thing with kids. They get sick very quickly and they go down very quickly unless mm -hmm. uh, they're dealt with. Mm. We're having this conversation, <laughs> and admittedly, I have a four-year-old mm -hmm. son, and my mind automatically goes on that. Maybe yeah. it's a, the parental part of me that's coming out here. As it should. But, yeah. <laughs> but you know, <clears throat> as parents, we try our best to create safe environments, <clears throat> controlled environments for our kids where we try to clean up so that the environment is sanitized to some degree or what have you. But... Perhaps that's in our own space, that's within the home or what have you. But when they go to play, when they go to school, they're exposed to certain environments that may not necessarily be as cleanly or properly kept, mm -hmm. right? Or in another scenario, <clears throat> you do everything so that your child is protected while in your custody. Mm -hmm. 
But like I said, here she goes to school, another child comes from a background or an environment where none of that, you know, has taken place and then they interact with each other and then things happen. Yeah. That to me is a serious concern. Mm -hmm. Some and, and even to freak you out a little bit more, mm -hmm. if um, I'm sick mm -hmm. and I come and I sneeze on this surface yeah. right now and I leave and then you bring your kid in here mm -hmm. and you know kids touch everything mm -hmm. so touches and then puts it in the mouth sometimes parents come in and ask them was anybody ill at home mm -hmm. was um was was were you in contact with anybody sick or at school mm -hmm. and they said no doc my baby stays at home and mm -hmm. and they but mm -hmm. that is how they get ill yeah. sometimes it's contact mm -hmm. from surfaces and you mm -hmm. can't predict that yeah. so when your kid goes to the park and jumps on the Monkey, monkey bars. bars. Yeah. A kid was there who just sneezed and yeah. did it. That's yeah. how you get it, and you can't predict it. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have an immune system, and that's why going all the way back to the first statements, foundation, sleep, yeah. exercise, eat, do the preventive stuff, and then mm -hmm. if you can target specific severe illnesses, we do it with the vaccines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In terms of, uh, I, I wanted to ask the question about the length of how long germs last on surfaces, if, if that is it, it does vary. Okay. Some of them, it's just seconds. Mm -hmm. For example, hand, foot, mouth. And that one is going around where mm -hmm. you get lesions in the palms, under the mm -hmm. soles, mm -hmm. and then in your mouth. Mm -hmm. And where you get a fever, and some kids get lesions all over. That's a hardy one. That one can live on services mm -hmm. for up to an hour to two. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. So after an hour to two, after somebody sneezes or touches it, yeah. another kid could come and get it. Wow. The, um, the meningitis case that uh, occurred, well, both cases that have uh, been occurring for the past week or so, uh, one of them leading to an unfortunate demise of a, of a child, has had parents worried and for good reason because I'm, I'm here sitting and I'm th thinking, I, I didn't realize that such a disease could, could end somebody's life. I know that you're, there are certain um, things that happen, some people get deaf and so forth after, after catching the, the disease, but can you walk us through the possibility of how this could occur and how it could have been prevented, if it could have been prevented? Well, meningitis, to simplify it, is um, the covering of the brain. So when the meninges become infected, that's what meningitis is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or anything that follows or is a prefix to itis. Mm -hmm. is infected so when your appendix is infected it's appendicitis mm -hmm. um so you have the skull the meninges is like a thick tissue yeah and then literally under that is the brain mm -hmm. it's the last protective barrier to your brain okay. Okay. many germs cause meningitis and the different germs that cause it vary depending on how old you are mm. so young young babies who are just born Commonest cause for meningitis is the in them are is a germ that lives within the, the vaginal canal of women, normal mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. But that's the commonest cause for newborn babies. And as we continue to go up with each age group, it changes. Mm -hmm. So for the kids who go to uh, to college, the number one cause is one called Neisseria meningitis. Mm -hmm. Ignore the name, but it's a germ that causes. Yeah. Meningitis in adolescent kids and the kids who go to, um, to any dormitory where mm -hmm. there's a group of them. Mm -hmm. In this age group, the number one cause is Hib, Haemophilus influenza type B. Mm -hmm. That bacteria is devastating. And for years now in Belize and the rest of the world, we give vaccines mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. prevent it. Two, four, six months when you take your kid, mm -hmm. they get a little fever. That vaccine prevents what killed Jace, mm -hmm. yeah. one of the germs. Mm -hmm. The number two, after they started to use that vaccine worldwide, um, they realized that the number two germ, pneumococcus, mm -hmm. became number one. And mm -hmm. so some of the more developed countries actually developed a vaccine against it. Yeah. Um, pneumococcus or strep pneumonia is a, again, devastating uh, illness. That germ can cause ear infections, mm -hmm. sore throats, uh, sinusitis, pneumonias, mm -hmm. but the number one uh, severe illness that you can get is meningitis. It's uniformly very, very, very invasive and very, very deadly when mm -hmm. you get it. And mind you, death is 
the worst thing that could happen. Yeah. But it's the brain we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you could come unscathed at the end of it mm -hmm. or everything in the middle. Yeah. So after meningitis, you can end up with um, deafness, yeah. mm -hmm. blindness, cerebral palsy, mm -hmm. uh, learning issues. So the whole gamut is there. And yeah. it's not just what happened to Jace. Um, but with Jace, I knew him. The parents showed me a picture mm -hmm. of, of I was at his delivery mm -hmm. and I was there when he was declared brain dead. So um, the parents are really good parents. Mm -hmm. And I, I spoke with them at length. And try to explain that sometimes it's not anything we did or didn't do mm -hmm. that caused something like this. But the process seemed to have gone very quickly. Uh, he was admitted not n how long, maybe like three days, yep. and then that's how quickly meningitis wow. can kill. Wow! And uh, and therefore, um, and it, the the procedure when he went in, it wasn't that there was any delay. Yeah. Everything mm -hmm. went the way it should go. But if the illness is there and it spreads very quickly, mm -hmm. you know. There's another, there's another case, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, the symptoms or the effect of the illness isn't as severe as what transpired in the case of Jace. Should parents be concerned, uh, I, if I'm not mistaken, from what I was made to understand is that this could have happened at a daycare center where the child or the children go. Yeah. Should parents be concerned about that kind of communal environment where kids are? Everybody should be concerned. Mm -hmm. And I think with any case of meningitis, as with this case, the um, Ministry of Health and their processes were triggered. Mm -hmm. So at the hospital level, all the docs and nurses who, even, who initially dealt with Jace had to get some medication and then it spread to the family and then Ministry of Health sent teams mm -hmm. to all his contacts at his daycare and at the school and they're following up on them for the next couple of weeks to see if any of them became ill. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the reason why the second case was picked up mm -hmm. very quickly mm -hmm. because when a kid came in who had contact with him or in mm -hmm. his environment yeah. um, with the similar symptoms, there was no delay in diagnosing and treating. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to explain that, yes, they should be concerned, but in our system, there are processes that mitigate that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. identify and target how to prevent it from spreading. Mm -hmm. so how long does the incubation period last then so that you can detect it before the symptoms start to show up? Well, to explain this to you, um, with pneumococcus, if I would swab everybody, everybody in this building, mm -hmm. one or two of us would have it. Mm -hmm. It's just that if your immune system is down and all the bad stars line up, mm -hmm. then you end up with a bad case of meningitis. Wow. The incubation period specifically is about two days to a week and then you start to have symptoms. Wow. But if you would have symptoms from pneumococcus, me and you, we would have mm -hmm. maybe a little ear infection or a little sore throat take some plantibiotics and we would recover easily. So it's our kids we really need to look out yes. for. And, and I think um, the bottom line with it, again, is prevention, especially with the vaccines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if parents are, comp are worried about it, they could, they could contact their pediatricians or some of the institutions and try and get their vaccine for their kids. I mean, I know I, I, have, I have several other questions, but I know your time is precious. So uh, <laughs> for this holiday season, provide us with some advice for our parents so that we are able to assist our children during this time of the year. I think we went through it maybe comprehensively just now. Mm -hmm. Just remember the COVID rules. Sneeze in your arm. If your kid is sick, keep them at home. Um, if they start to deteriorate, don't wait too long. Take mm -hmm. them to the health center, your doc can get seen. Yeah. Um, let them walk with their hand sanitizers. Um, the, our issue is that for two to three years, we've had a cohort of kids that did mm -hmm. not get sick. Mm -hmm. So for the next few years, we'll see a lot of kids getting sick around this time until their immune system Bill. catches up and become mm -hmm. immunocompetent. Yeah. Um, so my advice is, I won't say not to go to the parties and, you know, they just should do everything, safe. but just to be safe and to identify when your kid is ill mm -hmm. and get in to be seen quickly. Wonderful.
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Egg, for your time, for coming in. Get your flu shots, people. <laughs> Please uh, do your best to be as safe as possible. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank Egg. you, April. Thank you, Sunny. We are going to take another break, and when you come back, it's all about Belize Water Services. I'm switching gears a little bit. We can see how they can help us to prevent um, flu symptoms as well. We don't know, but they'll be in the studio, so stay with us. We'll be right back. <laughs>